So I know we all know what aging curve are. This is just a slide that I usually have when I talk to public meetings. But I don't really see a lot of park jumping yesterday, but this is a photo that was actually taken below Barkley Dam, which is where the bioacoustic fish fence is going in. So I did want to let you know that we have lots of aging carp down there and they do jump out of the water quite a bit, especially on our lunch um, Here in Western Kentucky, we do have all four, four species of aging carp. Black carp are the newest ones to this area. Um, they were first found in Lake Barkley in 2017 and then in Kentucky Lake in 2018. Um, we've only had adults so far and then most of them have been captured in commercial wheel nets when commercial fishermen are targeting silver carp. Um, but we have had one shot by a bow fisherman and a couple caught on a trout line that was actually baited with silver carp. So it was an interesting coincidence. But I um, just want to let you know that we do have those here. So this is a list of some of our research projects that we have going on. I stay busy even when I'm not helping plan with them on the So this is just a list, and I'm going to talk about a couple of these briefly, just hit the highlights. So I wanted to just let you know, we do have our telemetry project that's going on, and it is on the Tennessee and Cumberland River systems, and it's a joint effort with many states, including uh, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Alabama. Um, this project getting started in 2015 was one of the reasons why we were able to have the bioacoustic fish vents come to uh, Barkley uh, Lock because we already had this system in place and we were monitoring the passage of Asian carp water. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with the bioacoustic fish vents that's going to be installed at Barkley Lock in June, uh, so just a couple months away. But I was going to run through a few of uh, the details real quick and then if you have questions later, feel free to ask. So the system is going in at uh, Barkley Lock on the Cumberland River. So this is the Cumberland River here. And then this is Barkley Lock. This is the downstream, so the tailwaters. And then this is like Barkley on the side. And the uh, fish, the, right, the barrier is going to go where that red line is on the lower approach to the lock. So the bioacoustic fish fence, these are some slides from fish guidance systems, the ones who actually produce this technology. Uh, but it's um, sound that's emitted into an array of bubbles and lights. And so the bubbles help contain the sound to produce more of a wall of sound rather than broadcasting it out to the water like Josie's speakers do. So uh, this is just a closer picture of where that's going to go. The system is going to be mounted on the bottom of the uh, lock approach, so barges and other boats will be able to pass over without hitting it, hopefully. Um, they have to do some dredging in order to repair for that. But this is just an example of one of, one of their systems looked like at a previous installment, not necessarily what it's going to look like here at Barkley. But, um, so uh, these are the speakers, and then you can see the bubble plate and light bars down there. They had to do some pretty serious modifications to this system to get it installed at the lock chamber barges do drag trees and anchors and other things through there occasionally, so that's a, something that they had to work through with the engineering of it. But this is just an example of what the system might look like during the day and at night, so um, it's not a danger to anyone if it's all on the water like the electrical barrier is, but um, so that's a little bit about the bioacoustic fish. We also uh, monitor silver carp demographics in Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley. These are just a few things that we look at. Um, age, silver carp ages range from 2 to 11 years old, with the majority of fish being 3 years old that are in the reservoirs right now. So those fish were spawned in 20, well, they'd be 4 years old, but they were spawned in 2015. And that was the only, that was the first and only year that we've ever found young of year Asian carp in Kentucky and Barkley Lakes. Prior to that, we'd seen them in the tailwaters of the lakes, but we'd never actually seen them in the lakes. So that was a really big um, year for Asian carp to have a successful spawn, and that's where most of our fish are, you know, are at right now. Uh, for growth, silver carp grow faster in Lake Barkley than they do in Kentucky Lake. This isn't totally unprecedented. Lake Barkley is a little more fertile system than Kentucky Lake. There's a lot more agriculture runoff in the Cumberland River. Um, and we also see faster growth rates in species like marginal bass. But there's another factor here. Over 80% of our commercial harvest of Asian carp occurs in Lake Barkley. So the commercial fishery is continuously taking out those larger fish, which is reducing the competition in the system. 
size that's reflective of gross silver Cartland like largely or larger than the conceptually, but their condition is the same, calculated out to 93 in both ways. Uh, one of the questions we get the most is how many Asian carp are in the lakes, and so we started this project last year as a three-pronged approach to get that question and um, estimate relative limits. So we have a standardized sampling project, mark recapture study, and then also do a more intensive analysis of our commercial market data. So mark recapture, um, that was a joint project between us and TWRA, Tennessee Tech University, Murray State University helped out, and uh, TVA also. So there was a lot of different partners going on. We tagged over 1,200 fish about just over 600 <clears throat> in each reservoir uh, with these orange blue tags. And so, so far we've had five recaptures through the commercial industry. So that, that so says a little bit, but we're planning to continue this later this year. Um, I, what I do want to highlight, we do work with experimental years. Um, we worked with two rivers fisheries. They have some ideas with Chinese netting systems that they tried to bring to Lake Barkley, Kentucky Lake. So we let them fish those in the lakes with our supervision to monitor bycatch and other, um, other areas. Uh, but so far they haven't found um, the best system for the lakes. Their catch rates have been really low, if any. Uh, Josh mentioned about the USGS burrow trap and the cow net that we tested last fall. Again, catch rates have been really low with those um, years in our open water environments here in the reservoir. We are looking forward to continue working with Delaney and hopefully bringing the modified U5 method out here to try and some of our maintenance and see what we can do with that. Um, the gear type that we've experimented with or helped experiment with a little bit had the most success is the Papier net that Jeremy and Emily have talked about this week. So but in the reservoirs, their catch rates are much higher at night than during the day, which is very different from what they see in other water bodies. So there are differences in between um, open water systems and smaller rivers. So yesterday while I was on the boat, I got a few more questions about our commercial um, side of things. And Ron talked about this pretty well yesterday, but I did want to highlight a few things for anybody who had questions about it. So, our aging carp harvest program started in 2013. That's not exactly when commercial fishermen began harvesting Asian carp, but that's when we changed our regulations to make it much easier for commercial fishermen to target Asian carp. So um, that, this program allowed commercial fishermen access to all restricted waters year round, where before that they could only fish with gill nets from November to March. So this really opened up the doors for some regulations that we have, the harvest must be 65% Asian carp. The other 35% can be scaled rough fish like buffalo, gar, and drum. We're not allowed to harvest any sport fish, catfish, or rowing species. We do ride alongs with commercial fishermen about once a week, and we try to spread that out between the different fishermen that are on the water. Um, we do that just to monitor their bycatch and reporting standards. Fishermen that are on this program are required to fill out daily reports that include their catch information, harvest information, and bycatch, and then the condition of bycatch upon release. So that's where we get this um, bycatch information down here. So in this program, sport fish only account for 4% of all their bycatch. Most bycatch is uh, buffalo species. Their survival rate of sport fish is high at 96%. And that paddlefish survival rate is still pretty high at 84%. These numbers could be a little biased, obviously, because it's the commercial fishermen reporting on themselves, and that's why we do the ride right alongs as well. Just how many commercial fishermen do you have in the program? Um, so, the number of fishermen we have in the program varies from year to year. Um, we are working to increase the number of fishermen that we have out there. Um, generally, we have about 25 to 30 that are actually signed up for the program, but on the water fishing every week, probably 8 to 10. We had a couple of times that they were along with each group then and do the same thing? Yes, we, try, we rotate through what fishermen we ride along with them. Um, so, and also, our commercial fishermen use different techniques depending on you know, what they prefer, and so that's something we also take into account when we're doing ride right alongs. You know, if we've done Right along to the five fishermen this month that do dead sets, and we're trying to get some out with somebody who does something different. So, and Matt's going to talk a little bit more about that. Just get these things 
see the differences in the, uh, the data that you collect from the grad office and the data that's reported about the information that we have, right? We do. So that's, um, that's something that we put in our annual report, and we're also going to be looking at that a little more as we get more data, and we're trying to increase the number of ride alongs we do. Um, in previous years, we've done about 30 ride alongs, but um, last year, commercial fishermen made almost 800 trips to go fishing, so we're trying to get out there more and uh, get more information on of our ride alongs. Jessica, they, when they sell their fish, then they present you a, a receipt or something to get paid their subsidy? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so in order to get their subsidy money, they um, turn in their receipts from the processor and the weights that are on the receipts have to match their daily harvest reports that they're also turning in. So as long as those numbers match, then uh, we issue them a check. And so we actually pay the subsidy out on monthly basis. So they're required to turn in daily reports, but they turn in daily reports at the end of the month. And so we do all of our payouts in the month as well. I say a big job for that program is to put the uh, report as it matches the receipts that the process will provide. That's kind of our way of verifying that everything's on the other side. That's been the biggest uh, sticking point in terms of delaying the ones that we get at. Uh, of course, it don't matter. Right, 
2013 when the Vision Park Progress Program started. And this is graph runs by commercial license year, which is March through February of the following year. So uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, as you can see, in 2014, harvest increased pretty well, and then it kind of plateaued there in 2015. But in 2013, we had three different aging cart processes. Well, we had two aging cart processing facilities that opened, but one of those temporarily closed their doors in 2014. And then in 2016, harvest went up again to 2.6 million pounds. We had a third aging cart processing facility open during that time frame. So that helped drive the market up more commercial fishermen. <coughs> Questions about this? 